other than a dog contact with you as it poops, besides a toddler. Tell me I'm wrong. Like, you, your dog, you ever notice that? You're like walking your dog, your dog's all of a sudden pooping, he's like looking at you. You're like, bro, this is as embarrassing for me as it is for you, and I'm going to have to pick it up, okay? So look away, please, right? And your dog's just like, your toddler will, though, man. Your toddler will find you, grab a hold of the chair next to you, and... Are you pooping? No. Because toddlers are... Thank you. Yeah, some of you are like, no, Pastor, they're wonderful. God's gifts. Mm-mm. All right? Proof that sin enters into the heart of a child very young, the toddler. Now, Jesus lived a life just like all of us, yet without sin. So I don't know that Jesus was quite as evil as your toddler. But, but I want you to get the energy and the rambunctiousness and all of the everything going on with the toddler as you imagine this, right? The, the wise men come to the house and, you know, like they wouldn't have come with like a gift of diapers, right? They wouldn't have come, you know, with the gift of, uh, you know, like here's some pacifiers and here's some burpees. He's a toddler. Like he's growing. He's becoming, right? And so they show up and they bring three gifts. We talked about last week the gift of frankincense, right? We know that they bring the gift of gold. This week, let's talk about the gift of myrrh. Everybody say myrrh. myrrh. Right? Um, you're like, I think I have an uncle named myrrh. No. No, you don't. Um, it's a definitely an unusual gift. We'll talk about gold next week for sure. Um, but, you know, just for review, frankincense, the idea of frankincense would have been, um, it's right in the, in the word, frankincense. It would have been incense that the priests would have burnt. Uh, one of the uses of it, but it has many, but one of the uses of it would have been the priest would have burnt it, especially at the time where the sin offering was being brought. So everybody would come to the temple, and they would bring a lamb uh, and, or an animal, and they would make an offering, and then the priests would have to slaughter that animal, and then they would take the blood, and they would sprinkle it on the Holy of Holies, and they would burn this incense, frankincense, and as the smoke rose up to heaven, so did the prayers of the priest on behalf of the people would rise up to heaven. And that's the old covenant. We learned last week that the new covenant, that Jesus becomes the substitute for the lamb. He becomes the once and for all sacrifice for many. No longer do we need to have justice through the killing of, of innocent animals, but that Jesus gives his life once and for all. Now, this is this beautiful thing when we talk about myrrh. It's this valuable gum-like substance. And, you know, it's mentioned 17 different times in the Bible. It's occasionally used as an anesthetic. Um, and in, it has a, a, a Greek name. The Greek word for it is actually nard, which is interesting, right? So you have myrrh, and then the Greek word for it would be nard. And so, like, when Jesus is on the cross and they offer him, um, like, they offer him in, in, in the King James Version, they offer him a, a wine and nard mixture on the sponge. You guys remember that? They put it on a stick, and Jesus won't take it, right? Because it's an anesthetic, and, it's, and it can be, like, a numbing, have a numbing effect. And so Jesus is 100% there dying on the cross, for the sins of humanity. And, you know, like, so his life begins with the gift of myrrh, and then he's offered it again as he's at the end of his life. But it's most commonly used in, for the purposes of embalming. And so when you think about that, that the wise men, they come and they bring three gifts, gold, which, I mean, who doesn't want gold, right? Frankincense, which can be used for all sorts of stomach issues and ailments and things like that, but it also represents that he is the high priest and that we have a high priest who understands us. But then myrrh, what a weird gift to bring the toddler Jesus. I mean, sure, it, it could serve as a painkiller, but more often than not, it was used in the purposes of embalming the dead. And so when you see that gift, it's a, it's a foreshadowing or a telling of a story that would come that Jesus would be, he would give his very life for humanity. That he would be the suffering servant, the Lamb of God, that he was actually born for the purpose of dying for the sins of the world. Now what have I told you? 
that this was all foretold. 700 years before the birth of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, open them, and let's go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Could you imagine if you had the ability to know who was going to win the Super Bowl in February? Wouldn't that be legit? Like you knew right now who was going to win. What would you do with that information? Don't lie. You'd gamble. (laughs) Come on. Tell the truth. Shame the devil, right? You knew. You'd be like, I'd be placing a bet. Right? And I would not tell anyone. And then I would tithe off of my winnings. <laughs> yes, yes, you would, right? He, the prophet Isaiah knows 700 years. God speaks to him 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And he gives these mind-blowing prophecies that, that like, come to pass. And they come to pass like, like not only do you know the, like, who's going to win, but you know, like, the score and you know like the, the details of the game and you know like what the stats are going to be and what players are going to get injured and what it's going to look like and who the halftime show is going to be and how long to the second the halftime show is going to last. The commercial that will be the most favorited commercial of the Super Bowl. You know all that information. I want you to imagine like an angel coming to you or, or God speaking to you in a vision and he was like, this is what's going to happen. Right? Now, I'm giving you that so you can, like, wrap your head around it a little bit. But, like, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah, he writes down this information. And it's just kind of held as a prophetic word for the future about the Messiah that would come. And not everybody understands what it is. And in his writing, he does two things. One, he outlines the problem that humanity has. Number one. And number two, he writes down the solution that the Messiah brings. So let's look at them together. Number one, our problem. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, verse 6. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. All of us, like sheep. Read it with me. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. And so he's talking about humanity as a whole, but you as a specific human being as well. All, right? If you go all the way back to the ancient Hebrew, what does that word all mean in ancient Hebrew? Everybody. All, right? There's no, like, not me, right? It's everybody, all of us like sheep, and then he uses the metaphor of sheep. And all throughout scripture, the metaphor of sheep is used time and time and time again for two reasons. Number one, because he's speaking to an agrarian culture. The Bible was written to an agrarian group of people. So that means they were farmers, they were sheep herders, they were, they were you know, like this is the, the world that they lived in. But it's also a brilliant metaphor for humanity. Here's why. Sheep, everybody go, meh, that's pretty good, right? Sheep, it's not like a compliment to call someone a sheep, is it? Right, like in in our current political climate, when someone calls someone a sheep, it's a negative connotation, right? Like it would be different, it would be like, all of us like lions, right? All of us like the mighty eagle. All of you like sheep, meh. Right? I mean, it's, it's not a majestic animal. It's not, how do you say it? It's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And, and three things about sheep, um, and actually, you know, I grew up a large portion of my elementary and middle school years. I grew up in, in Bakersfield and in Bishop, California. And specifically in Bakersfield, there was a lot of sheep herders. And, and the sheep herders there... Um, like I, we got to, I got to see some of this firsthand in real life that sheep are these things. Sheep are weak, sheep are witless, and sheep can be very, very wayward. 
So when the prophet Isaiah says all of humanity are like sheep, everybody say sheep. He's saying weak, witless, and wayward. Well, isn't that special? Pastor, thanks for the insults today. I came to church to be encouraged because it's Christmas. And you're saying that I'm weak, witless, and wayward. At times, all of us are. I mean, come on. You can, you can train a dog, a bird, a hamster, a pig. You can even train a cat, believe it or not. But good luck training a sheep. And somebody's going to come up to me after church with a YouTube video of a trained sheep. I get it, right? But, but it's like, it, it, it's, it's not something that you see, right? It, it's because they're not that brilliant of an animal. They, they have a herd mentality, and they just go along with everyone else. And what the largest group of them do, the rest of them do. And when I say they're weak, what I mean is they don't have a natural ability to defend themselves. The only ability they have is to clump up together and run. That's all they have. And then even that is not the best defense mechanism, right? Like when all the wolf come, right? What do we do? There's a bunch of wolves. Let's get together and make a buffet for them. <laughs> do you see what I mean? Like they don't even have like a real like sense of what do we do now? I guess... Like, the closer to the center of the, the huddle that you can get, the safer you are. Sucks to be you on the outside. Thanks for taking one for the team. Sometimes sheep fall over and they can't even get back up on their own. Right? When we say sheep are witless, right? They'll follow each other into dangerous situations. Now, I've seen this firsthand when I was a kid. Uh, there was a, a hole in the fence, and I watched a bunch of sheep just like one after the other crawl through the fence and scratch themselves and cut themselves as they crawled through the fence and then get onto a public street that was busy. You know, like, and just one after the other. Oh, you're going? I'm going too. Let's all go. Hey, hey, this looks like fun. Let's play in traffic. But true story, in 2005, 1,500 sheep walked off a cliff in Turkey. 1,500 sheep walked off a cliff in Turkey. Only 400 died. The first 400 died, and then the 1,100 after that were cushioned by the death of the first 400. Tell me that sheep aren't stupid. Well, pastor, I mean, we're not like that. Oh, we're not? I mean, we just like, how many of you, again, tell the truth, shame the devil, right? How many of you ever had a parent say to you, if all of your friends were jumping off of a bridge, would you? How many of you ever had your parents say that to you, right? And how many of you really wanted to say, how high is the bridge? How deep is the water? But you're afraid you get smacked, right? <laughs> of course, if all of your friends were jumping, you would jump. Of course, if all of your friends are going into debt and buying cars they can't afford and houses they can't afford and things they can't afford. Of course, if everyone else around you is doing things that we know is harmful and dangerous and stupid, of course we'd all just do it. Why? It happens all the time. I want you to just stop for a second and I want you to think about your life and I want you to think about some of the things that you do on a regular basis that you know aren't good for you, but you started doing them and you still do them because someone else around you did it first. I'm convinced that no one starts smoking cigarettes because cigarettes taste good. No one. Do you know why we do it? Because somebody who we think is cool, we saw smoking and we want to be cool. And then we have a lifetime of addiction smoking cigarettes. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. Smoking cigarettes will not send you to hell. You'll smell like hell, but it won't send you to hell. Right? Like, it, I'm just saying. But, like, you, that stuff like that, it happens. And you know the first time you even do it that it's bad for you. But why do you do it? Might be bad for me, but I'm bad. 
you know that driving 90 on the freeway is not good. You know charging that much on your credit or refinancing your house again is not good. You know all of these things that you're doing that aren't the best for your life and aren't good decisions for your future aren't good, but we keep doing them. Why? Because, well, it's what everybody else does. It's not that difficult to do it, and we just go right in line with all of the other sheep. This is the problem that the prophet Isaiah is talking about. We, like sheep, have gone astray. And we're missing out God's perfect plan for our lives because we're like sheep. He says that they're weak, they're wit- like we say that they're weak, they're witless, and they're wayward. When we say they're wayward, in other words, we're prone to wander. And so when we wander, it's not that hard to get lost. Jesus talks about this in a parable where the one sheep gets lost and he's willing to leave the 99 to go find the one because every sheep matters. That every sheep to him is important. And so he leaves the 99 to find the one. But like, honestly, they don't do very good all by themselves. They need to be paired up at least because they're a herd animal. And so if you get one lamb and you keep it all by itself, it's gonna get anxious and depressed. Because they, in their DNA, are bred to be in a herd. And who are they going to follow? You know what will happen if you have one lamb? It'll just follow you. Because it doesn't know what to do. And so that the anxious and depressed, and, and, and again, if you have one and you don't put them together in a group, they'll... They, they won't eat right, they won't sleep right, they won't do right. Just like us, we'll eat too much, we won't rest enough, we'll overspend, we'll overwork, we'll overworry, we'll chase after things like approval and status and likes because we're like sheep. And so the prophet Isaiah, he says, all like sheep. 700 years before Jesus was ever born. almost 3,000 years before today. And he's telling your story, isn't he? If we're honest with ourselves, if we're, if we're like being real and authentic. But not only does Isaiah offer the problem, he offers a solution. All of us, like sheep, have strayed. We've left God's path to follow our own, yet... The Lord. Everybody say, yet the Lord. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Who's him? Jesus Christ. The Messiah. The Savior. And here's the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before the baby's even born. And he, he's talking about this, yet the Lord. Yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb being led to slaughter he was despised and rejected a man of sorrows acquainted with the deepest griefs we turned our backs on him and he looked the other way he was despised and we did not care yet it was our weakness He carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Interesting how 700 years before Jesus was even born, the prophet talks about the Messiah being the Savior who would suffer for the sins of humanity, and the Magi show up with a gift that articulates that exact same thing. 
It's interesting, too, because when you read the story, and at Christmas, maybe you have that tradition in your family where you're like, and then three wise men came, and they gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and then you turn the page. The end. And the three wise men came, and they proclaimed something about this man named Jesus, that he is the king of kings, that he is the suffering savior, and that he is our high priest who understands us. The gift of Jesus at Christmas isn't just that he understands us, but it's also the the high priest that understands us, but it's also that he's willing to suffer on your behalf. Because you know, you get the image of Jesus as the baby in the manger, right? But you know Christ in heaven was fully aware of the decision he was making when he clothed himself in that fragile state. You know, Christ, creator of heaven and earth, savior of the universe, who knew you before the foundations of the earth were laid, who fearfully and wonderfully made you knit together in the womb of your mother, saw through time and space all as if it was one moment in time and saw you as worth it. And even though you are part of the problem, we are all sheep who have gone astray, still chose to leave the splendor of heaven to become the baby so that he could become the savior to die for you. Yet in our weakness... debt and the weight of our sin and our shame are too much for us to carry on our own. And if you're honest with yourselves, the problem of us wandering, the problem of us making stupid choices, the problem of us being like sheep and just going with the herd became his problem because we couldn't do it on our own and so he came and did it for us look at verse 5 again but he was pierced for our rebellion crushed for our sins he was beaten so that we could be whole he was whipped so that we could be healed I like that they call him the lamb being led to the slaughter. I like it in verse 7 when they say that because here's what I like about it. If we are like sheep, if he comes and he takes on the form of us, but he's the perfected form of us, and then goes on our behalf and pays the debt of our sin and shame, a price that I can't afford to pay. So that he could take away all of my brokenness, all of my hurt, all of my fear, all of my suffering once and for all. So that I could have access to eternity, which I could never earn on my own. And yet he, 700 years before he was born, the prophecy foretells. 700 years before he comes, When the wise men show up, when the magi come and they give these gifts, they're giving, yes, the toddler Jesus and his mother Mary and his father Joseph. They're giving him these gifts, but they're also giving us a glimpse into the gift that Jesus would be for us for all eternity. And so when they call him, when Isaiah calls him the the lamb led to the slaughter, if he's a lamb and we are sheep, That implies, and he's the perfect lamb, right? What does that imply? I must follow. The only way is to follow the one. Because we're sheep. I can't go my own way. What happens when I go my own way? I get lost. I wander. 
And so I follow the one. The life of the Christ follower is not going to be perfect. It requires sacrifice. How do we know this? Because Jesus demonstrated it. You're like, Pastor, this isn't, this sounds a lot like an Easter message. It's really hard to separate the two. It's really hard to get to the, the real story, not just the, and then Mary saw an angel, yay! I mean, we can do that if you want. I mean, I think it's boring. But there's something more there, isn't there? There's something there that this man of God, 700 years before the baby was even born, when the Magi come, these spiritual advisors, these king makers, they show up on the scene and they bring these three gifts that are part of foretelling the the prophecy which teaches us about our problem and the solution. So if we follow the one, so why should I follow Jesus? Well, we talked about it last week. You, you don't have a high priest who doesn't understand you. You have a high priest who understands your suffering, your sorrow, your shame, and he went through everything that you go through. People talked about him from his very beginning. People talked about him. The, there was scandal surrounding, right, his origin story. Who was his real dad? And he grew up in many ways. At best, he grew up in a poorer working class family. And some people would paint the picture that he grew up in, in a refugee style of, of life. And both are somewhat accurate in both ways. Like, worst case scenario, he grew up like a refugee in more refugee camp style because of the oppression of the Roman government. It, best case scenario, right? He, it was a very poor man who his dad had to work with his hands and didn't have enough to really provide for everybody. They weren't affluent. They didn't have a lot. And so he understands. And the magnitude of suffering and sacrifice that he was willing to do after he lived this life of being an outcast, of being separated, of not being accepted. I mean, here he is, the Messiah, Savior of the world, creator of heaven and earth, and everybody treats him like some strange, weird, homeless man. And yet he still goes to the cross for you and I. I mean, when I think about the story, and again, I know it's Christmas, but Isaiah prophesies about this baby. He prophesies about this man. He prophesies about this Savior. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's so troubled and sorrowful as he contemplates the sin of, of you and I, the trouble that we've caused, that he would have to carry on the cross, that he begins to sweat drops of blood, a, a condition known as hemohydrosis. Extreme shock and trauma produces this result. And the capillaries around his face began to burst and blood became to come out of the, the, the pores of where his sweat would normally come out. His soul was so overwhelmed, he said, to the point of death, and yet he said in his prayer to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. He's arrested that night, falsely accused, unfairly tried, and sentenced to death by crucifixion. They strip him naked. Could you imagine the shame in today's world? Not to mention what that shame would have looked like in an ancient Hebrew world. To be stripped naked, they fashioned a crown of thorns and pressed them into his skull. They spit on him, they struck him, they whipped him, they beat him again and again. And as they beat him and they struck him, they said, oh, prophesy 
who hit you? Tell us, teacher. Tell us, Messiah. As they beat him, as they struck him, imagine the thorns in his head, how much that must have hurt already. As, re- as the insults and the blows are coming again and again and again. Isaiah implies that they rip out his beard, that he's beaten to a bloody, unrecognizable being. And yet they still make him carry the cross close to 700 yards as the path known as the way of suffering. Where they hang him on a cross at the rock called Golgotha, the skull. Nails driven into his wrists and his feet, hung on an instrument of torture reserved for traitors, runaway slaves, and the wicked. Weak from a loss of blood, naked, hanging in the heat of the day, fighting for every breath. As he hung there, it wouldn't take long for it to dislocate his shoulders. In the moment, it says the sky grew dark because the Father in heaven couldn't watch what was happening. So the Father actually even had to turn his back. And yet in that moment, Jesus turns to the thief on the cross and invites him to join him. In that moment, he says, I I was born to be the solution. I will die the solution. His whole life was for the purpose to be the gift of salvation. And salvation only can happen when the price of sin is paid. And then he hung his head. Right after he says, it is finished. And then he dies. Isaiah 53, 8 and 9. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants. That his life was cut short midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. For he had no wrong, he had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah said he would be buried in a rich man's grave. And what did they put Jesus in? They put him in the grave of Joseph of Arimathea. It's crazy, right? It's crazy that the story unfolds and when people go, Oh, well, someone knew that prophecy, so they all made it happen. Do you think in the craziness of all of that, that his disciples had the wherewithal to do that? His disciples, when he died, remember, they went and hid because they thought they were next. The leader of all of them, Peter, he denied him three times that night. He wasn't trying to make some sort of move. This prophecy is unfolding right in front of us. Why should I believe that he is the one? Why should I follow the one, the Lamb of God? Verse 11, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied because of his experience. My righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all of their sins. This idea of him being the sin carrier. In the Old Covenant, we talked about this last week, once a year. 
at the celebration of Passover, preliminary, temporary judgment day is what it was. Like, they would have this celebration, and it would be, you know, and it happens right when we celebrate Easter, by the way, if you didn't know that, in the Jewish calendar. And they would have this moment where they would bring a lamb, and they would sacrifice it, and here it is. It's Passover weekend, and here's Jesus dying for the sins of humanity. And God would unleash the most fierce, unstoppable force in the universe, the forgiveness Jesus Christ. I know that this idea of the cross at Easter is easy, but the cross at Christmas is confusing. But you have to understand that Jesus, when he left heaven, understood that that was his future. And so I want you to remember, you're like, Pastor, we came to celebrate today. Yeah, we will. And we are. But we're celebrating the gift of his sacrifice so that we can be free. We created a problem, and he is the solution. And so when we talk about the gifts, the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh, this embalming substance, this gift to Jesus as a child, why? Because it foreshadows the reality that he was going to be the suffering servant. In fact, if you look at Luke chapter 9, verse 22 and 23, and he said, this is Jesus talking, the Son of Man must suffer many things, must be rejected by the chief elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. The story of Christmas is so much more than just the story of a baby in a manger, of angels singing Gloria, of shepherds watching their sheep at night, of three wise men who bring gifts. It's the story when God became flesh. It's the story when he became the solution to the problem that humanity had been living in for years and years and years. It's the fulfillment of prophecy. And that when he looked down through time and space and he saw our lives and our lust and our selfishness and our greed and our hatred and our anger and our racism. He chose to become flesh. The wise men traveled and they bring the myrrh, they bring the myrrh because he is this child, God in flesh, Lamb of God, born to die so that we could live. Not just a baby in a manger, but the Lamb of God. The solution to humanity's problems. Now I understand that's a lot to tell your kids before you open presents Christmas morning. But in an effort to tell the story in such a way that the kids can understand it, I think maybe we've missed out on the power of the Lamb of God this Christmas and last Christmas and the one before that and the one before that. That the gift of Christmas is that Jesus, Lamb of God, left the splendor of heaven to be the ultimate sacrifice for you and I. Not only do we have a high priest who understands us, but we have one who's willing to not just make the sacrifice, but to be the sacrifice. Christmas is so much more than lights and presents and babies and mangers. It's so much more than blow up Grinches in our front yards. It's so much more than stockings hung with care. 
It's so much more than all the things that we can make it. And it's not that those things are bad. Those things are fine. In a little while, we'll go outside and we'll celebrate together and we'll have some shaved ice and we'll decorate Christmas cookies because it seems like the right thing to do in San Diego for Christmas. And that's okay. As long as you understand something. That in our celebration of the Savior, we're celebrating that he was the solution to the problem that we as humans created. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Do me a favor, stand up where you are right now. I'm going to ask two questions today as we close and then ask Aaron to lead us in one more song. Number one, I've got some problems in my life. I know who Jesus is. I've been serving Jesus, but I got some problems in my life that I've been trying to solve all by myself, and I need to let Jesus be the solution. If that's you right now, with everybody's eyes open and everybody looking, because we're family and we're here to help each other and we're trying to be authentic and honest, and it takes guts to say, I need help, but that's what we're here to do is help each other. If that's you right now, you got stuff that you need Jesus' help with right now, it's bigger than you, I want you to raise your hand. Raise it high. Come on, it's okay. That's good. That's good. While your hands are up, keep them up, keep them up. I want you to look around and I want you to see that you are not all by yourself. Look at this, right? We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And when the one sheep leaves, Jesus leaves the 99 and goes and finds the one. And if we're supposed to live our lives as a model of Jesus, then when you see the people standing around you, these are your friends. You sit with them. You're in home groups with them. These are your neighbors. You know them. You need to reach out to them and help them right now. Be there for each other. Amen? You can put them down. I feel like I'd be a terrible pastor if I didn't ask you this question this morning. Is there somebody here today for the first time or the first time in a long time you need to choose Jesus because you've been walking a path that is not the path he had planned for you. You have been lost, you have strayed, you have been far, far away, and it is time to come back to Jesus today. If that's you, will you just raise your hand right now? I'm just going to wait a minute. Come on, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Just a minute. Can we celebrate those couple of people right now? Come on. Father, we are grateful that you were willing to share your son with us to be the salvation of the world. That Jesus, you were willing to give your all so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be healed, that we could be set free. And so we pause this Christmas season and we remember the cross. Because not only are you the gift, the high priest who understands us, but you are also the gift of our Savior who suffered on our behalf so that we could be set free. These good gifts that you gave us, Father, these good gifts that you were willing to become, Jesus, and through the power of your Holy Spirit, we will follow after your example. And right now, we said we need your help. Right now, we said we've been far away. We need to press in and be close to you. And so we pray for all those who raise their hands, regardless of the question, that you would meet them right here in this moment and that they would feel your presence in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your willingness. Thank you for being the gift of Christmas. Christmas. 